The wealth gap initially was extremely high at a time when, of course, 90% of black Americans were enslaved, and then experienced fairly rapid convergence in the first 50 years after emancipation, and then reached kind of a flat line around the 1950s, such that the wealth gap we have today of six to one is approximately what we had way back in 1950. My name is Elora de Renincourt, and I'm an economist at Princeton University. I'm a member of the Industrial Relations Section and the founding director of the Program for Research on Inequality at Princeton Economics. In our study, Wealth of Two Nations, the U.S. Racial Wealth Gap from 1860 to 2020, we were interested in understanding what drives this very large and persistent racial wealth gap that we have in the U.S. today. The level is around six to one, so very sizable. And as an economic historian, I was interested in understanding what the historical pattern of that wealth gap was. But it turned out that there wasn't readily available you know, information on the evolution of black-white wealth differences going further back in time. So uh, we as a team assembled a new data set of white to black per capita wealth ratios dating back to before the Civil War from 1860 through the present. And uh, that was a substantial process to put that data set together. And what we learned from that time series was that the wealth gap initially was extremely high at a time when, of course, 90% of black Americans were enslaved and then experienced fairly rapid convergence in the first 50 years after emancipation and then reached kind of a flat line around the 1950s such that the wealth gap we have today of six to one is approximately what we had way back in 1950. Uh, so that means that the majority of the convergence that we've had in black and white wealth actually occurred again in the early period in the first 50 years after the end of slavery. Now, as an economic historian who focuses on black-white differences and particularly historically, that didn't align well with my priors about what were the key moments of black economic progress in the US, moments like World War II or the civil rights era. Instead, much of the convergence happened right during Southern reaction to reconstruction uh, after emancipation and um, during the rise of Jim Crow. So how do we make sense of that? It's useful to construct some kind of benchmark for how we would expect convergence to unfold starting from you know, emancipation. And the way that we did that was to write down a very simple framework for wealth accumulation for black Americans and for white Americans that incorporates both the starting conditions, how much wealth and income per capita did each group have, and what we call these parameters of wealth accumulation. So if wealth tomorrow is a function of wealth today, plus whatever you save from your income, and then all of that appreciates at some, what we call a capital gains rate, those parameters, the income growth rate, the savings rate, and the capital gains rate determine the accumulation of wealth over time. And we decided to start with a benchmark that said, let's get, let's start with the initial conditions and take those as given. So the gap in wealth in 1870 between black and white Americans, the ratio of white to black wealth was around 23 to one. And the ratio of white to black per capita income was around 3.6 to one. And we ask, now, what if the two groups experienced equal, we call wealth accumulating opportunities or conditions? And by that, we mean very precisely equal capital gains rates and equal savings rates. And all we take from the data is what we observe in terms of their income growth over that full time period. And there was income convergence between the two groups in the 150 year period. That uh, allows us to simulate the path of the white to black wealth ratio since 1870 under those assumptions. And what we see is that that shape of convergence where there's rapid initial convergence and then a slowdown in the mid 20th century, we replicate that in that very simple thought experiment. But we end up with a wealth gap today that's more like three to one as opposed to six to one. So we learned that 
the initial conditions, the just vast wealth differences coming out of slavery between black and white Americans, that gives us the path, this very slow multi-century path to convergence that we have in the wealth gap today, but it doesn't explain everything. And particularly why we have what actually now turns out to be slower convergence in the real world, in the real data, compared to this benchmark, that's driven by differences in wealth accumulating opportunities, differences in capital gains rates and savings rates. Much of the convergence that we've ever had in racial wealth differences, in fact, basically all of it happened before 1950. Um, this was a period in US history when, um, when we compare wealth relative to income in terms of their importance in the economy, wealth was still not as important as it has been in, say, the last 40 years. Um, that means that there was substantial convergence driven by savings. So for uh, black Americans, they're saving whatever they can from their income. We do find that those savings rates are not the same as for white Americans, which could be driven by their lower income position. So we have research that shows that lower income households tend to save less than higher income households. So we're not talking about something that's fundamental to black Americans. It could be explained by some of their characteristics. Uh, nevertheless, whatever they did save did help drive convergence in that early period. Now, what happens after 1980, we actually see, if anything, the wealth gap starting to diverge. So um, what do we mean by divergence here? You know, from 1870 through 1950, what we call the growth rate in the wealth gap, it's negative. That means we started with a ratio in 1870 of 23 to one, we fell to a ratio of around 10 to one in the early 20th century. By 1950, it's um, six or seven to one. So that means a negative growth rate because the wealth gap is getting smaller. But um, after 1980, we see, if anything, a positive growth rate. You know, So the wealth gap maybe is around six to one in, uh, 1980, but it's actually starting to climb closer to seven to one in the modern period um, around 2020. Um, what we find as the major driver of that period of divergence is actually differences in capital gains rates between the two groups. That means you know, differences in how much the stock of wealth is appreciating each period for the two groups. And where that comes from uh, is the difference in the composition of wealth portfolios across the two groups. So the average black wealth portfolio is um, majority invested in housing. Almost 70% of black wealth is held in housing today. Um, compared to white Americans, that number is more like 40%, with a good chunk of that held in equity. So something like 15 or 16% held in equity. For black households, that number is more like 5%. Now, in the last 40 years, both housing markets and stock markets have appreciated, but stock markets have appreciated by about five times as much. And so combining that difference in how black wealth is allocated across these different asset types versus white wealth, you know, that is uh, with the difference in uh, price changes for housing and um, equity, that is what explains this divergence today. It's the differential investment in equity for the average white household that has allowed them to gain more from the growth in stock prices over the last 40 years compared to black households. So um, today when policymakers talk about closing the racial wealth gap, and you really do hear that kind of rhetoric, you know, what can we do to close the racial wealth gap? Um, some of the very common proposals that come up are things like financial literacy. So how can we encourage black households to invest more in the stock market? Um, how can we encourage those households to save more? So both of those might be components of financial literacy. You also hear uh, proposals that, you know, really the differences are coming from income differences. So if we could shore up the labor market outcomes of black Americans, then this should improve their wealth because, you know, then they can save more from their wealth, et cetera. So we wanted to think about this again in terms of this long path to convergence that we are in and ask the following question. If we pursued any of those uh, proposals for closing the racial wealth gap, what would it take to achieve convergence by 2050, you know, 30 years from now? 
The answer is that black Americans would really need twice the capital gains rates of white Americans. So not only investing in stocks, but investing in stocks in such a way in the particular kinds of assets that would yield twice the capital gains rates of white Americans over the next uh, 30 years. Alternatively, they could save, say, 30% or almost a third of their income every year. That would achieve convergence through that mechanism in the next 30 years. Or uh, they could experience income growth rates of 8% per year. For context, savings rates among the white population in the U.S. today are around 5% per year, and income growth rates are below 2% per year. So it's very clear that, you know, Trying to achieve convergence through some of these popular proposals for closing the racial wealth gap, it's just going to be very difficult to achieve convergence in a short amount of time through any of those policies. In the paper, we just very briefly examine a different kind of policy for closing the racial wealth gap that has been um, proposed by a number of scholars, and that's the policy of reparations, reparations for the past harms of slavery. And uh, we take specifically the policy proposed by Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen in their book, From Here to Equality, where they calculate the amount of reparations through several different methods, um, and in the end settle on one that actually would, uh, it's the amount of reparations is that which would close the wealth gap between black American descendants of the enslaved and white Americans. And they show that these different approaches for calculating reparations actually end up around the same number. What they propose is a flat payment of 267000 per uh, descendant of the enslaved. Uh, that amounts to roughly uh, in the order of magnitude of $10 trillion. Um, sometimes I like to benchmark that with the infrastructure plan. You know, it's about three infrastructure plans or something like this, uh, just to give you a sense. So it's a large transfer. And uh, it highlights just how uh, significant this gap is and how difficult it is to achieve convergence through policies that end up really moving around very small amounts of money, say a, a wealth tax at the levels that we see proposed today or baby bonds, again, at the amount that we see proposed today. We really would need something much more ambitious and much larger.